One part of the 2008 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine went to Professor Harald Zurhausen at the German Cancer Research Center, who sought to understand what causes cervical cancer, the world's second most common cancer among women, with half a million affected every year. Against the prevailing view during the 1970s, Professor Zurhausen postulated a role for the human papillomavirus, or HPV, in cervical cancer. He and his colleagues went to identify the primary strains of the virus that carry the disease, HPV type 16 and 18. As part of their research, in 1984, they cloned HPV 16 and 18 from patients with cervical cancer. These virus types were consistently found in about 70% of cervical cancer biopsies throughout the world. Thanks to his discovery, 25 years later, two types of vaccines were ultimately developed that provide over 95% protection from the infection. The vaccines also reduce the need for surgery and the global burden of cervical cancer. Hello and welcome to this special edition of Talk Vietnam. It's a privilege and pleasure for us today to have an exclusive interview with 2008 Nobel Laureate in Medicine, Professor Harald Thorhausen, who is on a visit in Vietnam for the fourth ASEAN event series, Bridges, Dialogues Towards a Culture of Peace, hosted through the International Peace Foundation. Professor Thorhausen will share with us his journey in understanding the causes of cervical cancer. Thanks to his discovery, scientists have created a vaccine that has helped protect millions of women worldwide from the second most common form of cancer. Guten Tag, Mr. Thorhausen. Guten Tag. Thanks so much for your time. I know you have a very hectic schedule. How are you today? Well, I'm perfectly fine. Thank you very much. I had some interesting days behind me, so I'm really enjoying my, I enjoyed my stay here. That's excellent. Um, is this your first visit to Vietnam? Indeed, it's my very first visit. Uh, I've been in a couple of other Asian countries recently, but in Vietnam I never was before. How do you find it? Great. It was really a great experience for me. Uh, I spent uh, two days in Ho Chi Minh City, and now the last part of my visit here. And uh, so it was really a uh, fantastic experience. What I enjoyed very much was the kindness and the, the real generosity of the people here. Uh, we had some very nice discussions and uh, there were a num number of very nice experiences. That's great. What made you decide to donate your valuable time to the 4th ASEAN event series, Bridges uh, Dialogues Towards a Culture of Peace? Well, when I received the invitation by Mr. Morowitz, uh, it was quite tempting for me to follow. I, I thought it is a very good idea, although I wasn't really familiar before with the foundation. I thought it was a very good idea to have this foundation, science, as a kind of uh, communicator mm -hmm. in uh, this way also for, for peace. I believe that the exchange of scientific views between nations. Um, as a Nobel laureate, can you tell me, um, I'm really curious about this, were you always the top of your class? I, no, I was not the top of the class. Uh, I was in a grown up, I grew up in a very difficult period of time because uh, it was the Second World War. I was born in 1936, so when the war broke out, I was three years old. And when it ended, I was nine years old. During this period of time in 1943, in an area where I lived, there was a heavy bombing raids going on, and the schools closed. So for almost two years, from 43 to 45, I didn't go to school, almost not to school at all, except for an aunt of mine who was a teacher. She tried for a certain period of time to teach, but in a way my background was very poor. When, it, when I entered after the war, the high school, and uh, so I really had great difficulties uh, in the first year of high school, but subsequently, of course, then I caught up and then it was quite much better. No, I was not really the top of the class, but in the, let's say, during the major part of the school time. Where were you when, when you received the news that you would be um, granted the Nobel Prize? Uh, I was in the lab. I was uh, sitting on a computer, not in the lab, I was in my office, in fact. Sitting on the computer, it was a quarter to 11 in the morning. 
And uh, then, of course, when I heard a Swedish accent on the telephone uh, for a very short period of time, I thought it must be the right thing right now happening. And I was asked by the uh, secretary of the Nobel Foundation uh, not to talk about it until 11.30, because then there was an of the official announcement of the Nobel Prize. Uh, but I must commit, uh, I must confess that I broke this kind of promise because uh, I called my wife and she was already in a plane on starting a flight to Buenos Aires in Argentina and uh, the plane just left the gate but she didn't switch her cellular phone off so I could reach her indeed and uh, the stewardess came and tried to take the phone out of her hands because she told us you can't use it anymore. But she said, but my husband received the Nobel Prize. And the <laughs> stewardess was laughing and said, well, I haven't seen anything. Um, can you tell me how you felt at that moment? Well, I was pleased, of course, as probably every scientist would have been. Uh, it, it was quite nice. Uh, for my family, it was really great. They were probably much more pleased than I was and for uh, all, also for all the friends and for the cancer center it was clearly a nice day. So the uh, head of the cancer center, the administrative head of the cancer center organized instantly a big party <laughs> which started two hours later and about more than 1,000 people are probably were there so it was quite pleasant. Dear laureates, on behalf of the Nobel Assembly at the Karolinska Institute, it is my privilege and pleasure to express our warmest congratulations and our deepest admiration as I now ask you to step forward to receive your prizes from the hands of His Majesty the King. In your banquet speech following the Nobel Prize award ceremony, you mentioned your granddaughter, Hannah, who was three years old at that time. Um, she reacted to the news in a very special way. Can you elaborate on that for me? Yes, uh, of course I wanted to have her with me as well on, at that occasion, but uh, it didn't work out because my daughter-in-law was expecting another baby two weeks later, so she couldn't travel and Hannah stayed with her. But uh, the parents told her, uh, when the news came, that this is a very special prize and uh, somehow they, ex they explained that this is something which uh, is rare and uh, so in a way, gradually she became more and more sad and started to weep. <laughs> and uh, then they asked her, what's the matter, why do you cry? And she said, well, she said, I want to have the Nobel Prize too. So <laughs> And it was quite nice when I told the story later on to one of my colleagues. He was a moment silent for a while and then he said, well, he said, your granddaughter probably expressed what every scientist wanted to, wants to have. He said, it was the exception that you don't cry in public. <laughs> That's excellent. Um, can you please brief us a little bit on your career path? Um, was it a tough one? Uh, yes and no. It was tough because for a certain period of time, particularly after we started to work on papillomaviruses, a number of colleagues, my peers in, in the field, they were not convinced that this is the right track. In fact, there was a, a lot of uh, discussion on another agent, human herpes simplex virus type 2, that that might be the cause of uh, cervical cancer. But we had worked on this agent before and we couldn't demonstrate any genetic material of this virus in cervical cancer cells. So I was convinced that this is not the right agent to, to look for. And I'd found a number of uh, reports in the literature that genital warts occasionally convert into malignant tumors, uh, which is rare, but it happens. And so about uh, 100 reports over the past century prior to, to uh, starting to work on this topic. 
and the uh, idea was then, well, this might be a good candidate for looking at cervical cancer because it may be more carcinogenic at the cervical side in comparison to the uh, external genital sides. That was the reason really to look for papilloma viruses. I've seen in genital warts myself in the electron microscope that they did contain papilloma virus like particles. That it was not the f I was not the first one to see them. And so, uh, but we started instantly to try to characterize these viruses, which was not easy, but after about seven years really we finally achieved this and could isolate the genital wart viruses. We saw then that we were on the wrong track in, a, in the sense that these viruses do, did not cause cervical cancer, but with the eight, in particular two of my students had the task to, to genetically clone uh, related sequences which we found in these uh, in cervical cancer tumors and they were both quite successful so soon afterward in 83 and 84 we came up with HPV 16 and 18 and that really changed the, the picture completely. From the time of that meeting to the time when the world realized you'd been quite right um, it was a journey of about 10 years well, initially, let's say we started really to work on this quite intensively in 1972 and in 1979, this was seven years, we finally isolated the first genital papilloma virus, the human papilloma virus type 6, and subsequently with the eight of this virus, a related type 11. And uh, then we had again a little face of frustration because we didn't find them in cervical cancer with the exception of one biopsy which contained the human papilloma virus type 11. But we saw some faint bands in, in some of the test systems which we used and that suggested to us that cervical cancer contains somewhat related agents but not identical ones. And these were the ones where two of the students got the task to isolate them, clone them and to characterize them. When Professor Zurhausen asserted that the human papillomavirus, which was known to induce skin warts, caused this cancer, not many people believed him. He predicted that the virus existed in different types and changed shapes in tumor cells. He realized that no virus was formed there, but that certain virus genes instead integrated into the cervical cell genomes, thereby giving rise to the cancer over time. It was not possible to culture the viruses, but Zurhausen instead had to prove his hypothesis by using small bits of single-stranded DNA from the actual wart viruses. He used these bits of DNA as bait to be able to attract virus DNA copies, first from genital warts and later also from cervical cancer cells. After more than a decade of persistent work, he isolated different types of human papillomavirus that caused more than 70% of all cervical cancer. Virus genes were present in the DNA of every cancer cell and reprogrammed the cells to grow uncontrollably. His discovery has led to vaccines against these viruses, which offer protection against infections. After your winning project, what has been the focus of your research? Well, uh, since, uh, yeah, in, in fact, since the year 2001, 2002, I started in more intensively to look for additional types of cancers which might be linked to uh, infectious events. So I began, began to analyze uh, epidemiological data which existed on various types of cancer to see whether they provide any hint for a possible involvement of infectious agents. And one uh, cancer which interests us most and is still interesting us today quite intensively, when I say we, it's a team of my wife, as Michelle de Villiers and myself, uh, it's, uh, is colon cancer. Colon cancer shows striking features in epidemiology and it's known since quite a long time that's a link, that uh, exists a linkage between colon cancer and the consumption of what was called red meat and processed meat, smoked, air-dried meat, for instance. Uh, 
from a number of studies which I conducted subsequently, it became quite suggestive for me that it's probably our common kettle, which uh, may carry agents which present a risk for the development of colon cancer because everywhere in the world where beef or common cattle is being consumed at a higher rate, there exists a high rate of colon cancer in India, for instance, where uh, the Hindu population doesn't eat beef at all, this has the lowest rate of colon cancer. And so, so there are a number of similar situations and observations, particularly in Japan and Korea, where after the World War II, 20 years later, the rate of colon cancer was rising rapidly in Korea 20 years after the Korean War. And in both of these countries, there was a lot of introduction of beef meat and also a lot of consumption of raw or undercooked meat was taking place. So this led to the hypothesis that this is really the undercooked or rare beef, which uh, is a risk factor for cancer. Now, this is the reason why we started to analyze, and we are still doing it at this moment, to analyze uh, cattle materials, sera and also saliva, for viruses. And indeed, uh, we have been not very, but in a reasonable way successful because we could, in the meantime, identify some viruses and some of those are really identical to those which you can observe in humans. It doesn't prove that they cause cancer, but at this moment it's a good hint that it's worthwhile to look more carefully into this issue and to try to prove their potential role in cancer development, specifically in cancer of the colon. So this is one of the major activities. In general, we're going to see more links between infectious diseases and cancer in the future? Yeah, let me say it from the beginning, it's not only viruses, of course, there are also bacteria and parasites which cause cancer, but about two-thirds of the infection-linked cancers are due to viral infections. Uh, indeed, today we have about something like 21% of the global cancer incidents linked to infections, particularly here in this region of the world, in, in uh, Africa and a couple of other countries, the rate is quite high of infections linked to human cancers. Uh, yes, I think there's a good chance that in the future uh, we will have an increase in cancers linked to infections. Uh, if, for instance, what we suspect, cancer of the colon and cancer of the blood system, of the hematopoietic system, would be linked to infectious events, and we come quickly up to 35% of the human cancers linked to infections. So it points to a fact which was ignored for a very long period of time that infections are really major carcinogens. But one other aspect came up during this period of time, namely that none of the infections is by itself sufficient for cancer induction. Even though the cells pick up the genetic material, for instance, of viruses, this is not sufficient it may be a necessary factor for cancer development as in cervical cancer, but it's not sufficient because the same cell has to acquire some changes in the, its own genetic material at very specific sites. And this explains why there's such a long latency period between infection and the development of cancer, which in some cases uh, moves up to 60 years, six decades. So it's very, very long sometimes. And it, the length of the latency period appears to reflect the number of additional genetic changes which have to occur within an infected cell. What do you think is the most decisive factor in preventing cancer? Uh, for me, it's clearly the possibility now to prevent cancer. I mean, it's of course good to see at the moment that the uh, death rate on cancer globally is slightly going down, which is an effect of a successful cancer treatment. But we still see at the same time that the incidence, 
the increase that we have an increase in the number of cases acquiring cancer every year globally which is in part due to the uh, age situation of the population during the past decades in Europe in the states in parts of the in some parts of the world unfortunately not everywhere the population gets older we gain per, per decade approximately one and a half years of our lifespan and cancer is mainly, not exclusively, but mainly a disease of elderly people. And so with the increase in lifespan, the cancer rate is increasing. Uh, avoidance of some uh, carcinogenic compounds, avoiding, avoidance of uh, ultraviolet ir irradiation by sunlight, for instance, all these factors contribute to the development of specific cancers. But in each of these cases, this requires a change in lifestyle if you wish to avoid these risk factors for cancer. And vaccination, in a way, is a great advantage that it does not require a change in lifestyle. There's some other aspects which came up from the uh, development and the identification of infectious agents in human cancer, namely that we acquire many of these infections which after long, long periods lead to cancer and they persist in our body, in our blood for stream, for instance, but there are no novel means to treat these infections, even if they exist, like hepatitis C, there are novel developments, AIDS infections, for instance, uh, a couple of others, hepatitis infect, hepatitis B virus infections, and so on, where we can treat these persisting infections, they go down, the levels of the agents go down or disappear even completely, and this is another mode, how we can now think of, prevent, of, of a kind of a primary prevention of cancer without requiring later on a surgical intervention. So this is, in my opinion, um, one of the most important progresses which has been made and can be made in the future. During his visit to Vietnam this time, Professor Harald Torhausen delivered a keynote speech at the...